nuclear chemistry, or in other words, where did all those elements come from and how do some elements turn into other elements as if by magic? Let's check it out. Here before you see lots of examples of nuclear stuff going on. You got a nuclear power plant here. You got some strawberries that won't get fuzzy because they've been irradiated. That smoke detector and then a guy getting some kind of a medical imaging using radioactive xenon. So how is a nuclear reaction different from a normal reaction? Normal reactions just involve electrons, not the nucleus at all. Nuclear reactions only involve the nucleus. So it's all about protons and neutrons being absorbed or being released or being smashed together. And in just normal chemical reactions, it's all about let's share some electrons. I'll give you some electrons. You give me some electrons. All about the electrons. Turns out if you take all the particles in a nucleus and add them up. So all the protons, all the neutrons, add them all up and get a number. Then when you actually weigh the nucleus, Turns out it's a little bit less. In other words, the nucleus weighs a little bit less than it should. And you're like, wait a minute, didn't you tell me you can't create and you can't destroy matter? As a matter of fact, I did. That's in a chemical reaction, but remember we're talking about nuclear reactions. It turns out that some of the matter, the matter it's missing called the mass defect, gets actually changed into energy. And this is the equation that connects the amount of energy that comes from the mass that's missing. So we really only have two kinds of nuclear reactions that we need to think about. Nuclear fission, and fission means to break open. So you've got some uranium right here. In comes a neutron, it's gonna smack it in the nucleus, and that uranium is going to absorb it. It becomes unstable, and bam, it kind of splits itself up. So it's going to turn itself into krypton and barium and all kinds of other different elements. And at the same time, notice these little yellow circles coming off. Those are more neutrons being thrown off that could conceivably find some more uranium and keep the process going. Also notice this number over here. It says it makes two times 10 to the second kilojoules per mole of energy. And that's a lot of energy. So why are things unstable? Things are unstable because you have to have the right ratio of protons and neutrons. So notice the graph right here. The neutrons are in the y-axis. Yeah, that's the y-axis, very good. And then the x-axis is the protons. And again, you got that right because yes, that is the x-axis. But if you notice, it starts out going pretty straight. And then if you notice, it starts to curve upwards. And don't worry about all the other stuff on there, but notice that it starts out kind of straight and then it curves upwards. And that's because early on, it's a one-to-one -one ratio. You want one neutron for every one proton. Carbon-12 has six protons and six neutrons. It's very stable. Carbon-14 is unstable. It has eight neutrons and six protons. But as you start to creep up and get heavier and heavier and heavier elements, the ratio changes from one to one to more like 1.5 to one. So by the time you're down here where it says 80 protons, if you follow that sucker up, you're gonna see that it reaches up to about 120. And we call this graph right here, we call it the band of stability. If you're above the band of stability or below the band of stability, then your ratio is off and you have to decay into something else. The other type of nuclear reaction is called nuclear fusion. Fusion is not one atom splitting into several other atoms. It is instead two nuclei kind of smushing together to form a new nuclei. So if you look, this is what actually happens in the sun. You take two hydrogens and combine them into helium. And at the same time, you get a neutron. That's what that funny N is for and a whole lot of energy. You get way more energy out of fusion than you do out of fission. So we need to talk about a concept called half-life. Half-life is the amount of time it takes for half of something to decompose. Here's a graph 
of some oxygen that's decaying. It's unstable oxygen, so it's decaying over time. You start out with 20 milligrams, and as the graph goes down, all the way down, it goes from 20 to 10, that's one half-life, and from 10 to five, that's another half-life, and from five to two and a half, that's another half-life. And so we say the half-life is two minutes. It took two minutes between those first two purple lines for half of it disappear, and then again, half of it disappears, and then again, half of it disappears. Notice the graph is not straight. Notice the graph starts out very steep in the beginning and gets a smaller and smaller slope as we go. Now you might be wondering what happens to me if I'm exposed to some of this radioactivity. And there's different kinds of radioactivity. There's alpha emission, there's beta emission, there's gamma rays. We're not gonna worry about all that. We're just gonna say that radiation by and large isn't too bad. It just depends on the dose. A little bit of water when you're thirsty is good. A lot of bit of water will kill you. It's called drowning. You can look over the list here. You really don't get a whole lot of radiation just standing around. You go in to have x-rays all the time. Now you're talking about a lot more. Turns out the people that have the most exposure in their jobs to radiation is, believe it or not, airline pilots and stewardesses and stewards. People who work in planes because they're way up in the air all the time and the atmosphere is not shielding them from the radiation out around the earth as much. So they tend to get a much larger dose of radiation than you or I ever will. Now this radiation can actually be a cool thing as the half-life occurs and it changes from one element into another, then that element will give off signatures that we can read with devices. One of the things you can check in your, in your body is your thyroid gland. And your thyroid gland is kind of at the base of your neck. And there's two sides of it. And you can see that in the picture. And this is somebody who has a really, really big thyroid. And how do we do that? We do that by using something called technetium 99. And so you would swallow this drink and the technetium would go to your thyroid gland and then you could image it without having to cut you open and stare at your thyroid. You can actually get a picture of it just by giving you a small dose of radioactive chemical that you can then read. And your body doesn't hold on to this forever. The half-life is very short, so it's not like you're gonna stay radioactive for days or months or years. You're gonna be usually done with all the radioactivity in less than a week. Well, that's all I had to say about nuclear chemistry. There's actually a whole lot more, and maybe during the course of the year we'll get to bring it up. Food or radiation, where do new elements come from? That all has to do with nuclear chemistry. See ya. Go have a snack. <laughs>